In every crime, a story of a survivor, of someone left behind, of someone determined to solve a mystery. These are the stories of crimes that changed lives forever. This is Justice Rules. Murder, terror, and corruption, all words synonymous with notorious mobster James Whitey Bulger. He inflicted fear in the South Boston community for decades, and just when it looked like authorities had him, he fled and spent 16 years on the run before he was caught, tried, and convicted on dozens of charges, then sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. But in a stunning twist of fate, in October 2018, the 89-year-old killer was found dead behind bars, beaten almost beyond recognition. Reporter Bob Ward explains how the mobster himself may have turned into the last hit. A chilling, violent end to a murderous life. I hope it was a brutal murder instead of a natural cause. A force of evil who created a reign of terror ruling the Boston underworld and orchestrating countless cold-blooded killings. What did Whitey do to your family? Destroyed it. Notorious gangster James Whitey Bulger killed behind bars. From all accounts, James Whitey Bulger died a violent death at Hazleton Federal Prison in West Virginia. For decades, Bulger ruled the streets with an iron fist. But on the inside, Bulger's status on the street just didn't matter. It appears what ultimately mattered was Bulger's reputation as an FBI informant. And that put a huge target on his back. Sources confirm Whitey Bulger was attacked soon after he got to Hazleton, beaten to death with padlocks hidden inside socks. To understand Bulger's violent end, you need to take a look back at the violent path that led him there. For most of us, this was our first glimpse of Whitey Bulger, and it was a moment few of us ever thought we would see. James Whitey Bulger in federal prison Orange, escorted under heavy guard on his way to a federal court hearing in Boston. The man who was once the most feared name in Boston's underworld now reduced to a perp walk. James Bulger was born September 3, 1929, in Dorchester. He was one of six children and grew up in the South Boston Projects. Bulger served in the United States Air Force, receiving an honorable discharge in 1952. Then Bulger's life of crime truly began. There were arrests for bank robberies and other crimes, a stint in a federal pen where Bulger volunteered for an LSD experiment in return for early release. Bulger did time in Alcatraz. Finally, in 1965, James Bulger returned to the Boston area, joining the notorious Winter Hill Gang, known for its ruthless violence. In 1979, Bulger took over Winter Hill when indictment sent the rest of the gang's leadership to prison. Bulger and partner Stephen Flemmy set up shop in Boston at the Lancaster Street Garage, where the Massachusetts State Police shot this infamous surveillance video. Bulger and Flemmy soon became FBI informants, their handler, FBI agent John Connolly. It was a relationship that turned criminal. With Connolly's protection, Bulger and Flemmy knocked out their mafia rivals, killed anyone who got in their way, and made millions until their secret relationship was revealed. John Connolly now imprisoned for that relationship. In 1994, warned of federal indictments, Bulger skipped town first with girlfriend Teresa Stanley. But when she got homesick, Bulger dropped her off and picked up Catherine Gregg, another girlfriend, and they vanished for 16 years. This is an announcement by the FBI. And then the unbelievable. The FBI made a new PR push to find Bulger, but focused on Gregg. It paid off big. A former neighbor in Santa Monica, California, now living in Iceland, called the FBI and led them to the Princess Eugenia Apartments where the couple lived for years under the names Charles and Carol Gasco. June 22nd, 2011, James Whitey Bulger captured and returned to Boston for the first time in 16 years. The trial of James Bulger began in June 2013. Testimony of deep corruption, murder, and mob betrayal captivated Boston and the nation. August 12th, 2012, a jury convicted Whitey Bulger on 31 counts, including his role in 11 murders. He was given two consecutive life sentences. Bulger's life of crime caught the attention of Hollywood. The character of Frank Costello, 
played by Jack Nicholson in the 2006 film The Departed, is loosely based on Whitey. And Johnny Depp took on the role as the mob boss in the film Black Mass. In late October 2018, Bulger's health was failing. He was transferred from a Florida federal prison where he was in solitary confinement to Hazleton and placed in general population with other inmates. Whitey Bulger's time at USP Hazleton was short. Bulger's killers got to him within hours after his arrival, Monday night, October 29th. It all unfolded so quickly, Bulger's brother, Jackie Bulger, wasn't sure what was going on. I have no idea. That's the first I heard of it. I, I heard he wasn't feeling good a while back. That's all I heard. I don't, I don't have anything to say right now. William Bulger, James's brother, the former Massachusetts Senate president, quickly and quietly ducked into a South Boston home later that night without speaking to us. Sources tell Boston 25 News the prime suspect in the case is Freddie Gias, a hitman tied to the Springfield mob who's already serving life for his role in two murders. As for the second suspect, a source confirms a member of a North Shore crime family convicted for his role in the dismemberment murder of a 19-year-old woman in 1996 is being looked at. Paul J. D. Colagero was convicted of injecting victim Aislinn Silva with pure heroin before she was strangled. Silva's body found in pieces 10 years later behind a Peabody, Massachusetts elementary school. Authorities are also looking at a possible connection to former New England mob boss Frank Salemi. Over the summer of 2018, Salemi and another man, Paul Wiedek, were convicted in Boston for a 1993 mob hit. The star witness against them, former Bulger partner Stephen Fleming. Paul Wiedek is incarcerated at Hazleton. It was into that environment the Bureau of Prisons placed Bulger, not in segregation, but in general population. Former federal prosecutor Brad Bailey. His papers should have been red flagged all over the place that he should not be anywhere near or in any facility with any associates of the New England mob and or any ma made member or associate of La Cosa Nostra. If Freddie Gias is convicted for the murder of Whitey Bulger, under federal guidelines, prosecutors could seek the death penalty against him. On the streets of South Boston, news of the murder of Whitey Bulger doesn't evoke much emotion or surprise. Here's what it is, I guess. You usually get what you get coming to you, you know? Uh, I don't wish death upon anybody, but uh, I, they say karma, right? What goes around, comes around. As for family members of Bulger's victims... I hope it was a brutal murder instead of a natural cause, and I hope all the families and everybody else are looking at this as a positive and a close for them. I mean, I, I don't believe in closure because that's myself, but... I hope it closes the chapter in the, in the book for a lot of the families. The end of a long journey for justice. The end of Boston's most notorious mobster. Bulger's death came within hours of his transfer to the notoriously violent Hazleton Prison, a move that has been extensively analyzed and criticized. His attorney said in a statement, quote, he was sentenced to life in prison, but as a result of decisions by the Federal Bureau of Prisons, that sentence has been changed to the death penalty. It was the longest unsolved murder of a police officer in the country, a cold case for nearly four decades, until finally a break. Why it still may not bring closure for that officer's family. A young mother killed, her body found in a rolled up carpet in the woods. We had looked at several suspects over the course of time. Um, none of them really panned out to be uh, anything that we can put charges on. The new tip that could solve a 30-year-old mystery. She was known only as the buckskin girl because of the jacket she was wearing when her body was found. She was a very sweet, loving girl. Decades later, new technology finally gave her a name. The challenge now to find her killer. For 37 years, she was known only as the buckskin girl because of the tasseled buckskin jacket she was wearing when her body was found. DNA recently identified her, but now investigators in Miami County, Ohio, want to identify her killer. Reporter Cheryl McHenry looks into the life and death of Marcia King. 
she was loved. We didn't know where she was. She is no longer Jane Doe. The farm fields that blanket the Miami County countryside haven't changed much over the years. And that's one reason we wanted to move up here. It was nice and quiet. But every time Greg Breidenbaugh passes the ditch on Greenlee Road, he remembers what he saw there on April 24th, 1981. I mean, she was a pretty girl. She really was. She'd spotted this nice looking jacket. Right. Then he realized yeah. someone was in it. Well, she was laying on her right side, uh, no shoes on, that uh, buckskin coat and jeans and uh, kind of uh, brownish red hair. The young woman had no identification, but the buckskin jacket she was wearing gave her a nickname and attracted a cult following. If you go on the internet now, I think she even has a Wikipedia page, she became known as the Buckskin Girl. Investigators yeah. determined the Buckskin yeah. Girl had yeah. been beaten and strangled. For decades, they collected evidence and followed leads, but they needed a name. When she was found, DNA really wasn't even um, on the forefront and wasn't used in law enforcement. Science finally came through. The DNA Doe Project identified the Buckskin Girl as Marcia Sossaman King, 21 years old, from North Little Rock, Arkansas. She was a very sweet, loving girl. For her family, the news was bittersweet to finally know where Marcia was, but to learn she'd been murdered. Her disappearance had weighed heavily on her father, Jack Sossaman, who died of cancer in January. And I was glad that my husband didn't find that out when he was so sick. Her family has been able to help investigators by shedding light on Marcia and her life before she went missing. She was almost, she reminded me of a young deer, you know, getting loose in the woods for the first time. The summer before she vanished, Marcia had hitchhiked from Arkansas to Kansas to visit her father and stepmother. Cindy Sossaman says Jack warned his daughter about taking rides from strangers. She said, but I only take rides from truck drivers because they're nice. Marcia soon took off again and ended up in Illinois where other relatives lived. I felt she was troubled. Her aunt Wanda Byerly remembers a conversation she had with her son about Marcia. But he said she's really nice. But he said there's something heavy on her mind. Marcia had been diagnosed with a mental illness and needed medication, but didn't like to take it. When she returned to Kansas, her father and stepmother laid down the law. If you want to stay here, we'll help you, but you have to take your medication. And if she was wanted none of that, and so she disappeared. By early 1981, Marcia seemed to be searching for spiritual meaning. The search first took her to Pittsburgh, where she wrote her mother a letter. I want you to know that I'm happy, that I'm living with believers. From Pittsburgh, investigators say Marcia hitchhiked to Auglaize County. Marcia had become intrigued with the Way International, a Christian ministry headquartered here in New Knoxville. The investigation finds she had been here the month before she died, and though she had left and gone back to Arkansas, her body was found only about 40 miles south of here. So she was in Knox, New Knoxville for a period of time, but then she was in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, living with her family. Marcia often stayed with an aunt in Louisville. Chief Deputy Steve Lord says that's where she was last seen alive. Is this pretty much the, right now, the most significant piece of evidence, the April 10th receipt? We know she was across the river from Louisville. Yeah. Investigators are now zeroed in on the 12 days between the April 10th receipt and April 22nd, the day they believe she was murdered. Was Marcia headed back to New Knoxville? And who was she with? Time frame we're looking for him, but really is from Louisville back to Ohio. Uh, we're concerned with, you know, if she's hitchhiking um, or if she had a relationship with persons here in Ohio. Finding her killer may seem like a long shot after all this time. Well, they found out who she was in 37 years. I can tell you, if anyone can do it, these people here will do it. The person that did this should be nervous. On a rainy night this summer, the buckskin girl finally got her name back. She is Marcia Lenore Sossaman King. Her family came from out of state to see her headstone unveiled and to thank the people of Miami County who cared for Marcia when they could not. That's why leaving her here now gives her loved ones peace. Her mother said that she has lived here for 37 years. This is where she should stay.
Detectives are again asking the public for information that could lead to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible for her death. Anyone with information is asked to call the sheriff's tip line at 937-440-3990. A Florida mother murdered. Her body rolled up in a carpet and tossed out like trash. Her 11-year-old daughter left an orphan. Well, 30 years later, Tamika Jackson is still haunted by her mother's death and the fact that her killer has never been caught. She opened up to reporter Lorena Inkland about the quest to find her mother's killer. Basically right up here in this clearing. Okay. Like right up in here. Tamika Jackson took us out to this wooded area near Clanzel T. Brown Park near Moncrief Road. 30 years ago, her mom's body was found here, rolled up in a carpet. Jackson was seven years old. Do you feel like coming back helps you cope with? Yeah, it's, it's actually even, even, even this very moment, this, you know, this very day is therapy. During our interview, Jackson would get quiet as she remembered all the things her mom didn't get to see. Let me celebrate my mom's birthday with her. I don't get that. We don't get that. My siblings don't get that. The busy mom took the bus every day from her apartment just behind Clansell Park to the historic Seminole Club in downtown where she was made her D. On March 3rd, 1987, she never made it. Three weeks later, Jackson's older brother found his mom's body in the area known as a popular shortcut. We believe it was blunt force trauma, but there were some other indications that there might have been some more trauma. But of course, she was in advanced stages of decomp. These are photos of what the scene looked like in 1987. Action News Jack's Sky Vision drone shows us just how much has changed in 30 years. We had looked at several suspects over the course of time. Um, none of them really pan out to be uh, anything that we can put charges on. Police released this sketch of a man they were looking to question. The case was featured on projectcoldcase.org and its Facebook page. The exposure generated a tip related to this sketch. Someone revisited the case, looked at that sketch, and, and thought maybe there might be a connection. Police are vetting that tip right now. Sergeant Dan Jansen also tells me they're reprocessing some evidence, but they still need your help. Jackson knows someone watching has answers. Did she suffer? Was it quick? I, those are the things that keep me up at night. Was it quick or did you torture her? You know, I need answers. I want to know. She tells me she'll never lose hope that her mom's case will someday get solved come clean, you'll feel much better about it. You can sleep better at night <laughs> with a clear conscience. Nobody deserves that, nobody deserves that. A few years ago, an inmate known to Jackson and her family came forward offering a name, but police tell us there was no proof that person had anything to do with Sullivan's murder. If you know anything that can help police solve this case or any other unsolved murders, call Crime Stoppers at 866-845-TIPS. You can remain anonymous. A former police chief slain. The case cold for nearly 40 years. Investigators knew who their suspect was, but they couldn't track him down. It was the longest unsolved murder of an officer in the country. Until finally, a break in the case, more than 500 miles away. Reporter Rick Earl explains the case is now closed, but the chief's family is still seeking justice. This is the first time I'm actually talking to anybody regarding any of this stuff. Ben Adams is talking about the nearly four decade search for his father's killer. I mean, I remember him taking me to wash the car on weekends and there was, you know, the smell of the soap. He was just two years old when his dad, Saxonburg Police Chief Greg Adams, was shot and killed during a traffic stop in 1980. Yeah, this is the area of the scuffle. Sergeant Chris Burkbickler, who began working the case in 2005, showed us the crime scene photos. Adams had pulled over a car. A fight broke out. Adams was shot and killed. A dead man's driver's license found at the scene led police to Donald Eugene Webb, a career criminal from the Boston area with ties to the mafia. They believe he was in Saxonburg casing a jewelry store. Police found Webb's car at a hotel in Rhode Island, and their attention quickly turned to his wife, Lillian, who lived outside of Boston. She was under surveillance for years and years. But through the years, never any sign of Donald Webb. 
He became one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. In 2016, investigators searched Lillian's home and discovered a secret room with a chair and cane that locked from the inside. This exclusive photo of that room, it's the first time we've seen Webb's hiding place. Adam's family then filed a civil lawsuit against Lillian and Donald Webb, accusing them of wrongful death, and police turned up the heat. And I explained to her that uh, this case wasn't going to end. It was not going to stop, that I was the 15th or 16th detective to work on it in Pennsylvania, but I wouldn't be the last. I couldn't be the last if we found Dawn. Days later, investigators received a letter from Lillian's attorney. She had something to tell them, but she wanted immunity. Prosecutors agreed and set up a meeting with the 82-year-old woman. When I asked the question, do you know where Dawn is? Can you lead us to Dawn? She said, yes. I said, where's Dawn? She said, I'll take you to him. He's in the backyard. Lillian then took them out back behind a shed. She removed a small wooden stool. Uh, she set it aside. And with her foot, she drew a line in the dirt. And she said, he's buried there. She told them Donald died in 1999 after a stroke. She dug a hole and buried his body in a plastic bin. She said he admitted killing Adams years ago. It was a violent fight that left Webb with a broken leg and a lifelong limp. After the shocking admission and discovery, Burke Bickler had an emotional call with Adam's former partner. He said, God bless you and God bless everybody up there. Extremely satisfying. Did he ultimately pay for his crime? I mean, no. Was he brought to justice? Depends on your point of view. Ben Adams is still frustrated yes. that Lillian Webb was never charged, and he still has a lot of unanswered questions. He had to get some kind of medical support. He had to get some kind of help. He had to have something. And you don't think Lillian could have done it all on her own? No. After the shooting, Webb made it back to the Boston area using a fake name to get treatment for that leg injury. Meanwhile, Chief Adams' family has dropped that civil lawsuit. Lillian Webb has never spoken publicly about this case. Thank you for joining us tonight. And remember, for so many of these families, one tip could be the key to bringing them closure and putting those responsible behind bars for good.